Good evening, ladies. I'm glad you made it on this fabulous, is it President's Day? I should know this. Pretty bad. Um, we are going to get started tonight in um, Romans 8. So um, if you'll bow your heads and pray with me to prepare our hearts tonight. Father God, I just thank you for um, this evening, and I thank you for such a lovely day, weather-wise, and um, I just pray um, for everybody represented here this evening and their families, Father, for just heads of protection over them, for wisdom and guidance, um, for health and um, wholeness, Lord. I pray um, that we can open our hearts to your word, Father, and that you just allow um, me to speak whatever it is that you would have me speak this evening. We commit this time to you in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Okay, so... We are in Romans 8. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we have learned through um, the first seven books, chapters in Roman, about um, how we are sinful. Surprise, surprise. Um, and, you know, the, the first five books of the, of the Bible um, that called the Torah, it talks about all of the things that we have to do for salvation and all of the sacrifices and all of those rituals that needed to happen. And clearly they, it wasn't enough. We, we needed more and, and we needed Jesus. And um, so Paul in Romans is telling us that Jesus um, came and start, sort of created like this new community. It was like a second chance, I guess, a fresh start for, hum, for humanity and miss what I read. And so God's promises will be fulfilled by living according to God's rules. But now with the help of Holy Spirit, um, he talks about how Adam kind of messed things up for humanity um, by choosing to disobey God. Um, Eloise talked to us about, you know, the disobedience of one man versus the obedience of another, um, Adam and Jesus, and then the law versus grace and the flesh versus the spirit. Um, and Romans 8 kind of still continues on with that. Um, and so we are going to start in verse 1, 1 and 2. We're going to read a lot. Um, it is jam-packed full. There is so much in just chapter 8. I don't know how Eloise was able to cover three or four chapters. I know she feels like she didn't do them justice, but we're going to do the best we can in chapter 8 um, tonight. So verses 1 through 2 says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. There is no more condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. No punishment, no anger towards sin that we need to fear. In verse 2, this verse sets us up, sets us, sorry, sets us free from the law of sin and death. Freedom was huge for Paul. Many of the letters that he wrote during this time were while he was in prison. So he knows the burden of being captive and but the freedom that he's telling us about here is much more important. Um, his physical, more important than his physical freedom. I um, mean, he continues to tell us that we can't do life on our own. We need Holy Spirit to help guide us. Um, as women, I feel like we often carry the burdens of guilt and shame and the coulda, shoulda, wouldas um, of life. But these two verses remind us that in Christ, there is no condemnation through his sacrifice, we have been set free from the law of sin and death. Our, um, our salvation is secure, not based on our own efforts, but on the finished work of Jesus on the cross. I feel like for so long, um, and still sometimes today, I battle this works mentality. Um, you know, am I good enough? Am I doing enough? Am I working enough? And I'm, you know, are we doing all of the things that we, that we should be doing? And this performance-based thinking um, kind of ends up turning to maybe punishing myself, um, speaking negative, negatively about myself, and um, kind of points towards the, lack, the things that I lack. And so, sorry, um, <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I tend to try to control those things that I feel like I need to work on, the anger, the envy, the hatred of this, that, or the other, and I try to do those things on my own, but newsflash, I can't, and neither can you. And we can't fight the sin we battle in the flesh, but we can be free from all of these things with the power of Holy Spirit. 
The no condemnation part says that he paid it all. And I love this part. We can't do anything for him to love us more or love us less today or tomorrow or next week. Um, And that's pretty freeing. I think we don't have to work and meet a certain standard. He loves us just because he loves us. Um, And who we are, who he says we are is who we are, right? We um, don't have to live in bondage thinking that we aren't enough, that we're not good enough. And how liberating to know that those things that I struggle with, and maybe you do too, um, we're forgiven for those things. And not only that, um, he can change those things in us as well. Our forgiveness, our forgiveness comes from the blood of Jesus, and our life is sustained by the Spirit of God. Those two things go hand in hand. Okay, that was just verses one and two, y'all. <laughs> um, all right, we could park there all night. Just the condemnation um, alone is, is huge for me personally. Um, we're going to move on to Romans 5. It says, those who live according to the flesh have their mindset set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So with the Spirit of God inside of us, we will want what God wants and, um, and what he's called us to do. So I think one of the coolest parts of Paul's story was this exact thing. He was called to preach the gospel. You know, the guy that was um, persecuting Christians, right? He now wanted to do what God wanted him to do. Um, Holy Spirit can change our desires too. Um, The more we seek him, the more we are led by him. Um, Skipping down to verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. I sat here for for a moment um, reading this scripture and thinking of conversations that I had with um, friends um, who are also believers in and we had um, some conflicting thoughts on um, Holy Spirit. But this really, what this is saying is that every believer has Holy Spirit. Um, we can't say that some Christians are spirit-filled and others are not. If they are not spirit-filled, then they are not Christians. Um, how do we know that we have the Spirit? I'm glad you asked. Ask these questions to yourself. Has the Spirit led you to Jesus? Has the Spirit put in you the desire to honor Jesus? Is the Spirit leading you to be more like Jesus? And is is the Spirit at work in your heart? These desires are not fleshly desires. So there's your sign. Verse 10. God bless you. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Verse 12 says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you, but if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. We live in a world filled with distractions and things, different things competing for our attention. So how do we discern God's will for our lives? These verses tell us that we are to be led by the Spirit. To know this, we need to understand what it means to live by the Spirit or by the flesh. Living by the Spirit is about choosing to follow God's guidance and doing what aligns with His values, rather than just doing whatever feels good or satisfying in the moment. For example, my shopping habits, my ex shopping habits. Um, (laughs) Okay, so my husband, his name is Oscar, and I'll probably refer to him a lot um, today, but he is quite frugal, to put it kindly. He he is very, very different than I am as far as um, our expenses and finances go. Um, And so I, I realized that I... In the, I mean, I liked, I liked to go shopping. I could shop for hours, I, hours. Um, I would go. It was, to me, retail therapy. I loved shopping. I loved going to get new things and shiny things. And, 
But then I realized I was doing these things because I was frustrated about something or because I lacked something. It was more to fill a void um, that I was dealing with. And so that would be something that I realized was a fleshly desire, not something of the Lord for sure. And so um, quickly when I, when I realized that, that this was an issue, something that I was running to rather than running to the Lord for those things, the Lord began to change my desires. And Oscar must have been in prayer because he's very, very grateful for that today. Um, yeah, it seems like something silly, right? Like I, I mean, it's shopping, it's, it's that kind of thing. But I think we battle sometimes things that we don't even realize are, are a, a big issue. That's a fleshly desire and that don't add up to his values. They don't line up to his values. And um, until the Lord reveals us to us, you know, we don't know that. And so Paul says, we are children of God and are led by the spirit of God. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. He guides us, empowers us, and like Paul, transforms us from the inside out. Verse 15, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. If you remember back, um, well, we've had that in more recent days also, but people then were sold as slaves and clearly being a slave was brutal. Um, There was nothing good about that. And Paul is saying that we are God's children, that we belong to God's family. We aren't slaves anymore. Our identity is found in him, not in the opinion of others, not in our circumstances, not based on what you did last week or before church yesterday when your dog got out and you were in a hurry. <laughs> if I'm being honest, I tend to struggle with this, valid, with this, with the validation of others. And when I feel like I failed someone, especially at work or in ministry or in my family, um, it just eats at me. You know, I want to do a good job. I want to be supportive. I want to be resourceful at work and, and outside. But when somebody thinks that I'm not doing those things and they verbalize it, I, um, I tend to dwell on that. I'll lose sleep over it. I have arguments in my head. I know y'all don't do that, but I, I argue um, with them in my brain. And um, like it's just a whole thing, and it's ridiculous. But Oscar's constantly reminding me of Colossians 3.23, that we work willingly at whatever we do as though we were working for the Lord and not for people. And God has already validated me. And so their thoughts and their opinions don't matter. We are not meant to live in fear or as slaves to our circumstances or the opinions of others. We are embraced as beloved daughters of God, and we are allowed to address God intimately as Abba Father, as Daddy. My earthly father was not necessarily a reflection of my heavenly father, and I'm sure several of you can probably relate. So as a new believer... I struggled with this image of God, thinking that he was this mean, authoritative God who was just waiting for me to mess up so that he could punish me. And I now know I can have a close, affectionate relationship with him. And he does want me to respect and honor him, but he also wants me to love him and to call him daddy. I think about my youngest daughter, Elizabeth. And I don't know why I'm getting emotional. (laughs) Um... But when my kids were growing up, you know, we teach them to respond with yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, um, to be respectful. But when they were being disciplined um, for, say, riding on my new beige sofa with a black Sharpie, um, their response when they were being disciplined was yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. But it was more out of fear and not out of love. Yes, just like that. Uh, But... um, And now, of course, occasionally when they're being disciplined or having a a good talking to, they respond with yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. But more, my daughter is 17 years old, and when she calls me mommy, that really touches my heart. Um, 
I feel like that the relationship that we have is a loving relationship. It's not always an authoritative, mean relationship. Um, and so, I mean, I think that's just something beautiful. And so that's kind of saying, hey, the term Abba or the term daddy is a term of endearment, right? And God wants a relationship with us. It took a while for me to re realize that. Um, it also says here that it, uh, we will inherit his glory. But that also means that we will also share in his sufferings. We aren't exempt, unfortunately. We will face challenges and hardships, but we have God's inheritance. And we have Holy Spirit to guide us through the trials of life for us to be the best versions of ourselves. Like when we do redirect our children, we, we are there for them, guiding them and redirecting them so that they can be the best versions of themselves. In verse 18, it says, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. How many of us in the midst of suffering are thinking about the glory that's going to be revealed to us through this? Yeah. Pain is the gift that nobody asked for. Um, yeah, I don't wake up and say, you know, God, I think today I want to go through something really painful. Uh, but it makes, it makes us so much more compassionate and understanding when we do go through those things. And we use that pain to minister to others. Our challenges are our testimonies, and they can be used should be used to inspire and encourage other people. Paul is saying here, even in the midst of heartache and pain, we have hope. This hope anchors our souls in the promises of God. Verse 19, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the Lord of, um, of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Groaning. The pains of childbirth. Now, I know here it's referencing um, the book of Revelation and how God, you know, redeems his world. But even if you were to take this literally, and I did in the beginning, um, in t thinking of childbirth pains, I immediately was taken back to May 30th, 2002. And I will warn you, my mom is here. I'm sure she has lots of nice things to say about that day. But I have zero pain tolerance, none. Um, and so I'll be the first to admit I'm a big baby when it comes to pain. Um, my mom said once she would rather my brothers get sick five times before I got sick once. <laughs> so I was, I was kind of a pain. Um, but my first contraction almost 22 years ago dropped me to my knees, and I stayed there, literally, until I crawled to my car to, get in, to head to the hospital. Um, but not before I yelled at my mom and punched my best friend. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, it was, I was pretty bad. It's, I was pretty dramatic, I think. I was good with child, I was good round two with child number two. <laughs> hey, some things die, hard, die harder than others. Um, it was painful. But like childbirth, Paul knows that we're going to suffer painful things. We also know that God understands in these verses. He understands that the suffering we will endure is tough, but it's not always a punishment because of sin. Now, I've been reading through the Bible this year in chronological order, and um, I got to the book of Job, and I just felt really sorry for the guy, and I thought, wow, you know, we learned through him that he suffered and suffered and suffered through the entire book, and it was not because of anything he did wrong. The Bible says Job was a righteous man. He wasn't deserving of any of those things. So who are we to think that we won't go through it, any of that, um, if, the, if one of the most righteous men on earth did? We will see it the way God sees it one day. And in the middle of it, we'll find hope. Verse 24 says, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all, but hope for what they already have. 
or who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not ha- yet have, we wait for it patiently. Y'all, I read this four times today and I messed it up every single time. We don't hope for what we already have. We hope for things we don't have yet. Paul is saying we get to choose to have hope in our suffering. He encourages us to be patient and wait for the things to come to fruition and trusting that God will fulfill his promises in his own time. Verse 26, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. How cool is that? We don't know what to pray for, and that's okay. Holy Spirit has our back. He is constantly advocating for us, and his prayers do align with God's will. Okay, we're moving to Romans 8.28. I love this verse, and I don't remember why I had this, but back, gosh, 20, 22, 25 years ago, I had this as my screensaver on my red laptop. (laughs) And um, so verse 828, when I got to it, it just kind of took me back there. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I think I hold on to this verse so closely in different seasons of my life, losing a job or not getting the promotion or a severed friendship or my divorce. God has something better. Something good will come out of this. Those are typically the thoughts that we think or the things that we hear, the things that we tell others to comfort them. And I, I think those are okay. Those aren't bad things. But it means so much more than that. The last part says, according to his purpose. And his purpose is to make us more like Jesus. Verse 29 says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And this part's promising that all of the pain we suffer, the disadvantages and the disappointments and the illnesses, all the things, are to mold us into the image of his son. And those he predestined, verse 30, he also called. Those who he called, he also justified. And those who justified, he also glorified. What God started, he's going to finish. We might feel like we can't deal with things anymore, like we can't handle much more. So my question would be, when you go through trials, where do you turn to to find hope? Paul says that God started a good work, and he's going to finish it. We don't always understand why we suffer, but he will see us through it, all the way to glorification. Praise God. All right, um... As if this wasn't good enough, he throws in verses 31 through 39 because I was ready to finish there. But there's a few more verses. Verse 31 says, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who could ever be against us? Who? Well, our boss, our adult children, the lady in the drive through. <laughs> He's not promising that no one will be against us. What he's saying is that our problems or our oppositions might be big, but he's bigger. Those things don't really matter. Verse 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for for us all, how will he not also along with them graciously give us all of these things, all things? How humbling is this? Imagine losing your child. Some of you have experienced that. The pain is excruciating, to say the least. I I can't even imagine. But if God gave up his son, the person that meant the most to him, why do we worry about the rest of our needs? This should prove to us the value he sees in us and in our purpose on earth. God sacrificed Jesus to redeem us. Why would he do that and not provide us with what we need? That thing that you're hoping for, He's got it taken care of. Whether that be healing in your body or your marriage or your strong-willed child or his will for your life. I heard this question that made me stop and think. Why would he put his spirit in you and then hide his will from you? 
My daughter asked me recently, how will I know God's will for my life? It's right here in Romans. Being led by Holy Spirit. Understanding our identity as children of God. Seeking his guidance through prayer and aligning our lives with his character and purposes. The answer is clear as mud. Just kidding. We are all a work in progress. Can I be honest and say knowing these things and believing these things are two totally different things entirely? I heard someone once say, when we read the Bible, we should believe what we read, not read what we believe. I think that would solve many of, if not all, of the world's problems. Verse 33, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies, who then is the one who condemns. No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. If this is true, why do we fear disapproval or judgment of others? Why do we worry about anyone else's opinion? I ask this to myself, I think, more than anyone. John 5.22 says, in addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son absolute authority to judge. So ladies, if Christ has forgiven us, it doesn't matter what you or anyone else thinks about you. What matters is what he thinks about you. And he thinks you're pretty stinking amazing. You are who he says you are. Verse 35 through 39 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor a- neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the middle of all those things, he is going to walk with us. God is more powerful than anything that we can go through. Point number one, my only point, is to trust him. God showed us his immense love by us giving his by giving us his only son so that we could be honored and exalted. Through the resurrection made possible by Holy Spirit's power, we are given authority over sin and death. God promises to follow through on his plans for us, and this means we can trust that he is actively working everything out for our good. So sisters, as we reflect on Romans chapter 8, I challenge you, I challenge one, your hearts to be filled with gratitude, faith, and courage. And two, I challenge you to embrace your identity as daughters of God, believing that you are empowered by Holy Spirit to live boldly and confidently and victoriously in Christ. Turn to your neighbor and tell them you are loved. You are valued. And you are empowered by the one who sacrificed himself for you. Go. (laughs) You are empowered by the one who sacrificed himself for you. Amen? Amen. Thank you.